THE LAMAS PREACHING by S. R. Crockett And I further intimate, said the minister, that I will preach this evening at Coldshaws, and my text will be from the ninth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, and the tenth verse, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Save us, said Janet MacTaggart, he's clean forgotten, if it be the Lord's will. Maybe he'll be forgone whether it's his will or no. He's a sair masterful man, the minister, but when he comes for the Maccas, and kens little about the jealous God we have among the hills of Galloa, the minister continued in the same high, level tone in which he did his preaching. There are a number of sluggards who lay the weight of their own laziness on the Almighty, saying, I am a worm and no man. How should I strive with my Maker? Whenever they are at strife with their own sluggishness, there will be a word for all such this evening at the farm town of Coldshaws, presently occupied by Gilbert McKissock. Public worship to begin at seven o'clock. The congregation of Barnesock Kirk tumbled amicably over its own heels with eagerness to get into the kirkyard in order to settle the momentous question whose back was he on the day. Robert Kirk, Caisthorn, had a packet of peppermint lozenges in the crown of his lum hat, deponed to by Elizabeth Douglas, or Barr, in Barnbogery, whose husband, William Barr, put on the hat of the aforesaid William Kirk by mistake for his own, whereupon the peppermints fell to the floor and rolled under the pews in most unseemly fashion. Elizabeth Kirk is of opinion that this should be brought to the notice of session, she herself always taking her peppermint while genteelly wiping her mouth with the corner of her handkerchief. Robert Kirk, on being put to the question, admits the fact, but says that it was his wife put them there to be near at hand. The minister, however, ready with his word, brought him to shame by saying, Oh, Robert, Robert, that was just what Adam said. The woman thou gavest me, she gave me to eat. The aforesaid Robert Kirk thinks that it is meddling with the original Hebrew to apply this to peppermints, and also says that Elizabeth Kirk is an impudent besom, and furthermore that, as all the country well knows, here the chronicler omits much matter actionable in the civil courts of the realm. Janet, said the minister to his housekeeper, I am to preach to-night at Coldshaws on the text, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. I can, said Janet. I saw it on your desk. I patted to blow the clock, for fear the ones o' heaven mick blow it away like chaff, and you couldn't a do wantin' it. Janet MacTaggart, said the minister tartly, bring in the dinner, and do not meddle with what does not concern you. Janet could not abide red sermons. Her natural woman rose against them. She knew, as she had said, that God was a jealous God, and, with a regard to the minister, she looked upon herself as his vice-regent. His young and terrible ramstam, an opinionated for a book clear, but with little gracious experience. For all that, the root of the matter's in him, said Janet, not unhopefully. I'm going to preach at Coldshaws, and my text, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might said the minister to the precentor that afternoon on the man's doorstep. The Lord's no in our fit thoughts. I'll gang with the lad myself, said the precentor. Now Galloway is so much out of the world that the Almighty has not there lifted his hand from reward and punishment, from guiding and restraining, as he has done in big towns where everything goes by machinery. Man may say that there is no God when he only sees a handbreadth of smoky heaven between the chimney-pots, but out on the fields of oats and bear, and up on the screes of the hillsides, where the mother granite sticks her bleaching ribs through the heather, men have reached great assurance on this and other matters. The burns were running red with the mighty July rain when Douglas McClellan started over the meadows and moors to preach his sermon at the farm-town of Coldshaws. He had thanked the Lord that morning in his opening prayer 
for the bounteous rain wherewith he had seen meet to refresh his weary heritage. His congregation silently acquiesced, for what, said they, could a man from the Maccas be expected to ken about meadow hay? When the minister and the precentor got to the foot of the manse loaning, they came upon the parish ne'er-do-well, Eby Kurgan, who kept himself in employment by constantly scratching his head, trying to think of something to do, and whose clothes were constructed on the latest sanitary principles of ventilation. The ruins of Eby's hat were usually tipped over one eye for enlarged facilities of scratching in the rear. If it's your will, minister, I'll come to hear ye the night. It's drawing to mere rain, I'm thinking, said the scarecrow. I hope the discourse may be profitable to you, Ebenezer, for, as I intimated this morning, I am to preach from the text, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Aye, minister, said Eby, relieving his right hand and tipping his hat over the other eye to give his left hand free play. So the three struck over the fields, making for the thorn tree at the corner, where Robert Kirk's dyke dipped into the standing water of the meadow. Do you think you can manage it, Mr. McClellan? said the precentor. You're what half way up the leg already. And there's six feet of black moss water in the lane burn, as sure as I'm leaving Sal, added E.B. Kurgan. I'm to preach at Coldshaws, and my text is, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, said the minister, stubbornly glooming from under the eaves of his eyebrows, as the swarthy men from the Maccas are wont to do. His companions said no more. They came to Camelon Lane, where usually Robert Kirk had a leaping pole on either bank to assist the traveller across, but both poles had gone down the water in the morning to look for Robert's meadow hay. Take care, Mr. McClellan. You'll be in deep water if all you can. Oh, man, ye had far better turn. The presenter stood up to his knees in water on what had once been the bank and wrung his hands, but the minister pushed steadily ahead into the turbid and sluggish water. I canna come, or I canna come, for I'm a man that has a family. It's not your work, stay where you are, cried the minister without looking over his shoulder. But as for me, I'm intimated to preach this night at Coldshaws, and my text... Here he stepped into a deep hole, and his text was suddenly shut within him by the gurgle of moss water in his throat. His arms rose above the surface, like the black spars of a windmill. But E.B. Kurgan sculled himself swiftly out, swinging with his shoeless feet, and pushed the minister before him to the further bank, the water gushing out of rents in his clothes as easily as out of the gills of fish. The minister stood with unshaken confidence on the bank. He ran peat water like a spout in a thunder plump, and black rivulets of dye were trickling from under his hat down his brow and dripping from the end of his nose. "'Then you'll not come any further?' he called across to the presenter. "'I canna, oh, I canna, though I'm most awful willing. Kirsty would never forgive me gin I was droon. "'Then I'll e'en have to raise the tune myself, though three times Kilmarnock is a pity,' said the minister, turning on his heel and striding away through the shallow sea, splashing the water as high as his head with a kind of headstrong glee, which seemed to the precentor a direct defiance of providence. E.B. Kurgan followed half a dozen steps behind. The support of the precentor's lay semi-equality taken from him, he began to regret that he had come, and silently and ruefully plunged along after the minister through the waterlogged meadows. They came in time to the foot of Robert Kirk's march dyke, and skirted it a hundred yards upward to avoid the deep pool in which the Lanaburn waters were swirling. The minister climbed silently up the seven-foot dyke, pausing a second on the top to balance himself for his leap to the other side. As he did so, E.B. Kurgan saw that the dyke was swaying to the fall, having been weakened by the rush of water on the farther side. He ran instantly at the minister, and gave him a push with both hands, 
which caused Mr. McClellan to alight on his feet clear of the falling stones. The dike did not so much fall outward as settle down in its own ruins. Eby fell on his face among the stones with the impetus of his own eagerness. He arose, however, quickly, only limping slightly from what he called a bit chack on the leg between two stones. "'That was a merciful providence, Ebenezer,' said the minister solemnly. "'I hope you are duly thankful.' "'Dod, I am that,' replied E.B., scratching his head vigorously with his right hand and rubbing his leg with his left. "'Gid I hadn't a guinea you that dunch, you might a preacher none at Colchos this night.' They now crossed a fairly level clover field, dark and laid with wet. The scent of the clover rose to their nostrils and almost overpowering force. There was not a breath of air. The sky was blue and the sun shining. Only a sullen roar came over the hill, sounding in the silence like the rush of a train over a far away viaduct. What is that? queried the minister, stopping to listen. Eby took a brisk, sidelong look at him. I'm some dootsum that'll be the sky boom coming doon off a Cairnsmuir. The minister tramped unconcernedly on. Eby Kurgan stared at him. He canna ken what a sky boom one in is. He'll be thinking it some bit mackers burn the lads set their whirly mills in. But he'll turn right enough when he sees sky boom roaring reed in the flammer's flood, I'm thinking. They took their way over the shoulder of the hill in the beautiful evening leaning eagerly forward to get the first glimpse of the cause of that deep and resonant roar. In a moment, they saw below them a narrow rock-walled gully, ten or fifteen yards across, filled to the brim with rushing water. It was not black peat water, like the Camelon Lake, but it ran red as keel, flecked now and then with a revolving white blur, as one of the cold shore's sheep spun downward to the sea with four black feet turned pitifully up to the blue sky. Eby looked at the minister. "'He'll turn new if he's mortal,' he said, but the minister held on. He looked at the water up and down the roaring stream. On a hill above, the farmer of Coldshaws, having driven all his remaining sheep together, sat down to watch. Seeing the minister, he stood up and excitedly waved him back. But Douglas McClellan, from the Mackers never gave him a look, and his shouting was of less effect than if he had been crying to an untrained collie. The minister looked long up the stream, and at a point where the rocks came very close together, and many stunted pines were growing, he saw one which, having stood on the immediate brink, had been so much undercut that it leaned over the gully like a fishing rod. With a keen glance along its length, the minister, jamming his dripping soft felt hat on the back of his head, was setting foot on the perilous slope of the uneven red-brown trunk, when E.B. Kurgan caught him sharply by the arm. "'It's not for me to speak to a minister at ordinary times,' he stammered, gathering courage in his desperation. "'But, oh, man, it's fair murder to try to gang o'er that water.' The minister wrenched himself free, and sprang along the trunk with wonderful agility." I'm intimated to preach at Coldshaws this night, and my text is, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, he shouted. He made his way up and up the slope of the fir tree, which, having little grip of the rock, dipped and swayed under his tread. Eby Kurgan fell on his knees and prayed aloud. He had not prayed since his stepmother boxed his ears for getting into bed without saying his prayers twenty years ago. This had set him against it, but he prayed now, and to infinitely more purpose than his minister had recently done. But when the climber had reached the branchy top, and was striving to get a few feet farther, in order to clear the surging lynn before he made his spring, Eby rose to his feet, leaving his prayer unfinished. He sent forth an almost animal shriek of terror. The tree roots cracked like breaking cables and slowly gave way. An avalanche of stones plumped into the whirl, and the top of the fir crashed downwards on the rocks of the opposite bank. "'O oh man, call on the name of the Lord!' cried E.B. Kurgan, the ragged preacher, 
at the top of his voice. Then he saw something detach itself from the tree as it rebounded, and for a moment rise and fall black against the sunset. Then Ebi the outcast fell on his face like a dead man. In the white coverleted room of the farm town of Coldshaws, a white-faced lad lay with his eyes closed and a wet cloth on his brow. A large-boned, red-cheeked motherly woman stole to and fro with a foot as light as a fairy. The sleeper stirred and tried to lift an unavailing hand to his head. The mistress of Coldshaws stole to his bedside as he opened his eyes. She laid a restraining hand on him as he strove to rise. "'Let me up,' said the minister. "'I must away, for I am intimated to preach at Coldshaws, "'and my text is, "'Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, "'do it with thy might.' "'My bonny man,' said the good wife tenderly, "'you'll preach best on the broad o' your back this money a day, "'and when ye rise your best text will be, "'he sent from above, he took thee, "'and drew me out of many waters.' 